Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our live webinar session, whatever you want to call it, uh, on today, Saturday. Uh, today, we're doing our level design session, and what that means is that we're going to take a look at how we design levels in video games, and in particular, we're looking at doors. Um, more on that in a moment. First of all, I want to say hello to everyone in the live chat who's joining us live. Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Solo Newbie. Hello, Dark Dagon. Anton Sun got your life. Hello, how you doing? Super J Rusty, hello. How are we all doing? Um, we're just gonna get started in a moment. We'll just wait for more people to fill in. Um, and we'll talk about more about what we'll be doing today. Um and why we're here, um, in particular. So hello everyone. Hello Marissa, hello D Jolly Moss, Jessica, hello, Helfi El 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 Izio. uh Yao from Brazil, hello. How are we all doing? Everyone okay? So tell us, what are you guys all working on? Why wait for more people? Uh, what are you guys all working on? Let us know in chat what are you, the current projects you're doing. Let us know what kind of games you're doing. Share and share alike. You all know that I'm working on Mimic, um, which is going quite well. We've done some improvements to the animation systems and all that. I can't wait to share that with you next month. Um, but yeah, let us know what you're working on. I've been curious. Modeling a hallway in Blender, very nice. Hello, hello, Swole Steve Gaming. Hello for being new. Welcome. Doors all week. This live is perfectly timed. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, love your videos. Also, we have all. I'm working on an RP that is compatible with DD. Oh, excellent. That's awesome, Marissa. Been distracted by Remnant 2. I haven't yet played Remnant or Remnant 2. Um, yeah. Modifying the quest system for Mother 2. Excellent. That's good. Also, working on portfolio projects. Excellent. Exploring Lyra. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. It's good to see a variety of things going on. I'm always intrigued to see what people are working on. Um, it's fascinating. So what are we doing today? So today we are looking at uh, doors in level design in particular. And the reason why we're doing this is because level design is a core skill that I find typically is usually the weakest spot that game developers find and they'll go on YouTube and learn how to make games using Unreal Engine but they won't know how to actually make interesting levels or follow interesting level design or at least be aware of these certain things um, coming from a game player perspective. So hopefully today we're going to try and adjust some of that thinking. Now I have done a previous live stream where I've done a li live stream about level design in general. Um, so if you want to check out more generalized level design stuff check out that live stream it's up on the archive you can watch it back whenever you like. Um, but this one we're going to look in particular looking at doors and what their purpose and flow, uh, function is in a game. So um, first of all let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve with doors. So with the doors problem there's a classic example to bring up and it, the reason why we focus on doors a lot as a game designer is because they are something that is all over the place in games but no one really pays attention to it. And it's a great example to highlight to you as a game designer how much you have to think about these things. And this is where I'm trying to get across to people when they're trying to learn Unreal Engine or just game design in general, is learning about those extra thoughts you have to have that game players typically don't have. And that's where you separate yourself from a game player. So this is uh, inspired by a uh, blog post article by someone called uh, Liz England. Uh, posted it back in 2014, uh, but they came up with an interesting uh, article talking about the door problem. And I just want to talk about some highlights in this. So you're making the game and you've got to have a door. So these are the questions that you may ask yourself. Are there doors in your game? Can the player open them? Can the player open every single door? Or are some doors just for decoration? How does a player tell the difference between doors that they can open and ones they can't? Are doors you can open green or the ones you can't red? Is there trash piled up in front of the ones you can't open? Or did you just remove the doorknobs? Can doors be locked and unlocked? What tells a player's door is locked and will open versus a door that is locked and will never open? Does a player know how to unlock a door? Do they need a key? Do they hack a console? Do they solve a puzzle? Uh, to wait until a story moment passes? 
And are there doors that can be opened but a player can never enter them? Where do enemies come from? Do they run in from the doors? Do those doors lock afterwards? How does a player open a door? Do they walk up to it and it just slides open? Does it swing open? Does a player have to press a button to open it? Do locks, doors lock behind a player? What happens if there are two players? Does it lock when both players pass through the door? What if the level's really big and can't all exist at the same time if one player stays behind and the floor disappears? What happens to them then? Do you uh, stop one player from progressing any further until both are together in the same room? Do you teleport the players that stay behind? What size is the door? That's a very big deal. Uh, talk about, and we've, I've got some interesting anecdotes about that. Um, does it have to be big enough to player to fit through? Uh, what about card games? Can both players fit through it? Um, is that, is one can one block any other player? What about allies that are following you? What about enemies? Do they follow you through doorways at all? It is many bosses are bosses that can follow through doors. So as you can see, there's loads of things to think about and consider when you're just designing doors and it's just a door. But what's really good about this is that a good game design, a good level design, is not noticed by the game player. A bad one is 100% noticed. And that's what we're looking at today. So I'm not going to go through here in great detail about how to actually make a door. I've got plenty of videos about how to make doors, interactable doors of various types on the channel. So if you're interested in actually making the door, I'll give you a preview of what I've done. But if you're interested in making it, check out those videos after the stream and you can learn how to make whatever doors you want to make. So what I've got here, basic setup, is a door and a button setup. And the door is pretty simple. And if you've ever seen any of my door videos before, it will look quite familiar. We've got in here a door with a couple of options. We've got is locked and we can identify what switch it's tied to. I've tied to this switch over here. And the door code is pretty simple. All we've got in here is saying um, we've got an open door function and a closed door function. And here we're also working out direction that we want the door to go in. And here we've got overlap for when we leave the doors area. And we've got when we interact with the switch to unlock the door. And you've got lock and unlock as two extra events too. And so a lot more detail of that in those videos. So check that out when you want. Uh, but that's general gist of it. And it looks very similar to that. And we've got a nice hinge door. So for example, I can walk up to this button, hit the button, and then open the door. And the door will always open away from me. Now it may seem like a subtle thing, but that's super important. It's not realistic. Real world doors don't do that. Well, majority of them don't do that. Doors don't open away from you all the time. They typically only open one way. The reason why we do them open both ways and like this, uh, away from the character in a game, is because it doesn't break our flow. I can be running forwards, hit E, and just keep running forwards. If I have to hit E and then step back away from the door and then go through it, then it kind of breaks my flow. It, it's, it's disruptive. It's uh, annoying. It whacks you in the face or whacks you in the character. It's not nice. So we uh, continue to flow with the character. And you're going to hear a lot more about flow as we continue through this. So um, listen out for that. But always try and make the doors open away from the character if they're on hinges. If they're sliding doors, make sure they're going slow enough or going the right direction. Because if a door, for example, goes down into the ground, and it has to come back up, be aware that a player could be standing on top of it, which you don't want to do. So if a door's never going back up again, you can make it go down. But if it's going to go back up again, try to avoid doors that go down. Try to make doors that go from the top. Okay? That's a lot nicer and a lot less um, um, breaking. So that's the kind of setup we've got here. So let's talk a bit about door design. So... Over here, and, and this is, goes to everyone who is a Patreon member who is now doing the Creator Challenge, which is a monthly sort of jam where you're creating something. Um, what I'm looking for are things like robustness and uh, functionality and, and configurability. Like how can you configure these sort of objects um, as you're making them? So here we have a door and I've, I've got two simple settings here. I've got is locked and switch. So which switch is affected by it? But I can tie it to other things. I can put other things into it, such as like, do I want the door to auto close behind me every single time? Or do I want it to remain open? Well, the opening and closing of that is handled by my end overlap. So I would put in things like a boolean and say like, um, is auto close? And default that to true. Bring that in and put that into a branch in my overlap here. and make it editable by taking a little Bible. And that's it. 
So now I can configure whether this door is going to open or close automatically. I say close automatically when I leave the area. So if I turn it off, for example, and open the door, it won't close behind me. It will stay open. Okay. And there's lots of other things I could do there too. We could affect the speed of it, for example. How quick is it going to open the door? Uh, we can affect the directionality of it. Especially if it's a sliding door. There's lots of little little, little uh, configurations we can put onto it. And that's what we want to do as a game designer, as a programmer, is you're trying to make things as useful for you as commonly as possible. You're trying to make things that can be used over and over and over again, rather than trying to remake the same uh, the same code over and over again. You're just using the same blueprint, etc. So try to think about things that you could do to make things configurable, uh, configurable about your doors or any uh, anything you do in your game. So let's talk about doors design in their aesthetics. So over here, we've got two doors. And we've got door A on the left, we've got door B on the right. Now, right way, you can probably assume that door B is more important than door A. Why is that? Well, that's because we've used a recess to push the door into the wall and make it stand out. This separates it from the rest of the world. This makes it seem important. So not by just changing the model of the door, you can also change what's around the door to affect how important it is to the player. So if you want the player to choose a door over the other or make them feel like that's more the critical path, then give them that extra little recess, columns around it, some decoration of some kind to make it stand out. This is very important as it allows the player to instantly know what way is the critical path. This is why doors in like Zelda, for example, stand out if they're boss doors versus other doors. Now let's talk about the main crux of this. The various points about designing a level with these doors. So let's take a look at the first option, signposting. Now signposting relates to what I just said. How do we tell the player where to go and what to do? As a good level designer, your job is basically to corral and herd the player to the correct location. Whether they realize it or not, they want to be herded to the right place. You don't want them to get lost. You don't want them to get confused. You want to make sure they end up where they need to go. So as a as a designer, we're trying to do that. Now, the easiest thing I could do is I could take out all the doors except the one that matters. We can do that. But we end up having a problem with that. It makes the world feel like a rat in a cage and a maze. You feel like you're trapped. You feel like you're just running around in circles following a critical path. You feel like you have no agency or choice in the matter. The trick is to give the player choice, but also not giving them choice. You're making them feel like they are making decisions and making being an active participant in the world, but they're not. So how can we make the world feel bigger than it actually is, whilst keeping the player on the critical path? That's where we come up with signposting. Signposting itself could be its whole lecture on its own, a whole webinar on its own. Um, so we're just going to touch on it a little bit. But signposting is literally just what we talked about with the other doors in that you want to make the door stand out in some kind of way. But what's most important about this is that you're consistent with it. So, for example, if we're doing like a post-apocalyptic post type game and I want to stop the player going through the broken doors here, I could, but I still want doors there because I still want to make it feel like the world has got stuff in it, I would use something like planks. We could just put planks of wood in front of our, in front of our doors and instantly it will feel a bit more taped off and speaking of tape we could use our police tape for example um things like that um and you just like vary up a little bit just design it to look a bit nice a bit normal like that so the world still feels bigger it still feels like we've got stuff in it but stuff is locked away from us more on that in a moment but that's time posting in general and we can use things like lights and we also use composition and we also use um, guiding lines to help us signpost our way to the, where, which way we want the player to go. So we're signposting our player now into this way. And down this corridor, they go into the next point, which is composition. If you don't know, if you've never heard of the word composition before, it's basically how you frame your shot. And when you're a photographer, it's all about how you frame the shot in a single still image. In a film, it's how you frame it within the camera lens. But in a game, it's at any moment in time when the player's walking through the game, what do they see? How do we frame the player's focus? So right now, I've got lots in my shot. 
I've got lots of information. I've got two ramps. I've got a pillar. I've got a button off the top of a ledge. I've got um, like a door in the shadow here uh, on the right hand side. But it, all of it is telling me lots of information. The critical path is like you go, you want to get like usually you're going forwards. You're trying to move about the flow. We'll talk about flow in a minute. I get more. But you're trying to go forwards. And so you want to try and put the end goal inside of the player, but maybe out of like reach. And that's where we get to that button. The button's out of reach, but it's in front of us. We can see it. We're not hiding it from the player. We're just saying like, here it is. Come get, come get me. Yeah. And when you talk about composition of this shot, we've now got two ramps. You may be thinking, what's the significance of two ramps? And you'll see this happening in lots of games. You'll put a ramp at front, one at the back, um, or maybe just one at the front. But you usually will frame it like this. Why? Well, by putting a f one here, this one here, this invites the player to go up this ramp. It's inviting to say like, hey, this is a legitimate way for you to go. You can go up this ramp. If I didn't have that there, this is now not as enticing. The player's going to have to be forced into the level, which if you want to do that and force them into the level, by all means, do that. But in this case, I want the player to go this way. So therefore, I'm not forcing them into that level. I'm trying to say like, hey, you can go up this way. So here they're going up here. Now, dealing with that signposting issue again, we've got a, a door in shadow. An easy way to signpost a door is just to light it up somehow. And this could be didactically through the game, through like lampposts and lamps and sirens and other things like that. Um, but in our little block out here, we just do a very simple, um, we'll do a simple uh, spotlight. Like that. So lighting is just a way of, of signposting that through. We could use textures, the guiding lines, uh, animation even, all sorts of things. So now we highlight the door and we show the people where to go and what to do. So let's go up here and interact with this door. Now notice there is a door there um, and we could, the player could happily go and try and open it. It won't work, but they can try and open it if they want. But let's go back up here into here. We're trying to encourage the player through this way. So now we're up here with the button and we talk about linking. This is very uh, a very important task to do. We need to link ideas together. And that can be achieved in multiple ways. We could achieve it with uh, artwork, such as this cable I've got running from this button down to the door down there. Obviously, it doesn't do anything. It's just a visual thing. But cables, pipes, uh, things like that are really commonly used to handle things like this. We want to show which way things are going. Um, another way you can do it is through just putting things next to each other. For example, just positioning things next to each other, it assigns that to that one thing. So, for example, in an elevator, when you've got a button for an elevator, that button is usually next to the elevator. If that button was far away from that elevator, it makes no sense for them to be connected. Yeah, our brains don't connect those two in the head, but if we put it next to each other, we can assume safely that that button there will open the elevator. Now, all this may seem like common sense, but this is all stuff that someone at some point has had to think about, and you will too. Now, another common way of linking things together is through cutscenes or animations. So, for example, when I push this button here, we get a nice little cutscene which shows us down here and shows us the door is opening. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, it's very obvious linking. Yeah, we've been very deliberate with it. Why would you want to be deliberate? Well, it depends on your audience for your game. If you've got a younger audience or an audience that's more casual, people that aren't going to pay attention to a lot of stuff around them, like this cable, you may want to do something like that cutscene to showcase where to go next. This is very common for children's games, especially like the Lego games. If you hit a button in a Lego game, the camera will pan over to what it's unlocked, unlock it and show you the effect it's had. Very, very commonly done. That also has a signpost as well saying like, this is the way you've got to go. Yeah, the camera will follow back the path that you have to come and back to where the door is showing you which way you need to go. So when you're building at your levels, bear in mind of your audience and their experience level. A lot of time I ask someone like what their target audience is for their game. And I always get that same old answers like it's um, it's for uh, male and females. It's for 16 to 32 year olds and PC players. Great. That means nothing because that's like a whole swath of people. So what is the audience? And a big 
factor of the audience you're thinking about is going to be like their experience level with games. Um, are they brand new to gaming in general? Are they brand new to racing games? Now, if you're brand new to racing games, you may have things like auto steering and uh, auto throttle, things like that. That's very common in kids like kart racers. But if you're in a game like Forza, you're expected to be coming in from an experience level of knowing racing games. Same goes for environment design. Yeah, we, uh, if you're playing Naughty Dogs games, you don't need to be told to follow the white or yellow markers. You know what they mean. You know what to do with them. Same with explosive barrels. We don't need to know the red barrel explodes. We know that from our experience. Same goes with everything you're doing in level design. Always think about the experience the player has with that genre, with gaming in general, or just controls or anything like that. It's usually a big, big significant uh, marker for wh where you design a game. So, in here we've unlocked this door and we're going to go jump down. Okay, now, oh, flow, we mentioned that before. So, flow is very, very important for a game. We want to make sure the player feels like they naturally are flowing into one thing to the next. It may not be the critical path, and so to speak, like the objective, but it's still on their main path they, they're traveling to. And by flow, you want to make sure that forwards is always kind of the way. And that's true for even like, um, like Metroidvania games when you're going backwards. When you go to the end of the corridor and get the pickup and you go back, the way back has got to show things slightly differently to you. And this may be just revelationary stuff. Like you realize, oh, I have an icon, an item that can open that. I have a key that can open it now. Uh, and a new ability, I could, oh, I can reach up there now. You're revealing stuff to the player. Metroid Prime does this brilliantly. So when you're on your way, you're backtracking through a level, backtracking through that same room looks and feels different because you have new information. But in a single player game, like what we've got here, flow in, is simply to say like hey we're trying to encourage the player to go like if they drop down here the most likely thing the player will do is go through that door now i don't want it to be the main route because the main route's got to be tied to that button i've just done so what would i put behind that door let's take a look so if i go down and interact with the door hey it's a save game a save game room and map room whatever you want to use it's a place where you can get resources it's a place where you've got a safe space for the player to save the game research up what they got to do things like that so it's, i'm encouraging the player to save their game I encourage them to get to this place and do their thing blah 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 do their thing and then leave and i press so flow again i've put the door they need to go through in front of them so all the time i'm just putting things in front of the player and say like here you go do, 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 do. if you ever seen like wallace and gromit um the one with the penguin the wrong uh, the wrong trousers and in that scene with the, the, the train, he's placing track down as he goes. It kind of feels like that. You're just, the train's going, you're just placing track in front of the train as, as it's moving. That's what it feels like as a, as a game level designer. You're trying to keep, guide the train where you want it to go. Same with the player, you're trying to guide them where you want them to go. So let's go through our door. And we go through this corridor. And now we're going to talk about something that I guarantee every single one of you has done as a player. And that is doorways as bottlenecks. Boom. Ah, bad guys. Right. So the issue we have with bad guys in this situation is the most likely thing the player can do in this situation is use this door as cover. Pop, 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 pop. Yeah, very common. I guarantee every single one of you have done this. Let us know in chat who's done this in a game ever. I have. Yeah, you, we, we just cheese it by just hiding, shoot things from the door. Using like a hard mode or something like that. We, we want to cheese things. Uh, it's, let us know what game you did it in. Like, call them out. What game did you done? Yeah, all the time. Happens all the time. Lots of games have it. Now, this is a big problem. For us as a game designer, that's a massive problem. I don't want the player to be looking at this the whole entire time. That's not fun. Yeah, Fallout does it a lot. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, it, it, you don't want the player to be looking at the wall like that. That's not fun. That's not exciting. That's not pretty. Um, why the hell would you do that? Yeah? And this is not strategic. This is just cheesing. This is not fun whatsoever. Plus, you may have designed an amazing arena for battles to take place in. You may have designed all these enemies, all these cool abilities, all this stuff. Um... And no one's going to see it because they're going to cheese the door off and just like boom, 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 and take them out that way, which is totally fine. That's a valid strategy. 
But why is that the valid strategy? Why is the player encouraged to do that? And more importantly, how can we stop the player from doing that? So let's think about this. The main thing we're looking at here is value. Whenever you're composing a shot like this, think about value for the player. If you had to like put a mark on the pen and just like annotate it and put like a positive and negative over the screen, this shot here would be all negative. The player progressing further into the room is nothing but bad for them. They get no gain from it, no rewards, no benefit, no advantage. Everything is a disadvantage. Everything is a negative for them. The only positive for them is this little bit of cover. So therefore, that's what they're going to do. That's why when they're looking at this, the strategy is to do this. Which is obviously not great. So how do we can stop that from doing it? Well, it's about changing that field of view. Changing that value markers. How we're placing those positives and negatives in that composition of the shot. So here we've got a composition. How can we increase that? Well, one is by giving the player choices. Rather than giving an empty room like this. And I see this a lot, by the way. Empty rooms in all the student games I look at and all that stuff. The biggest issue I see is level design, and this is a co very, very common problem I see. Is they'll just chuck like enemies in the room and think that's enough. The level and the enemies working together is what makes that arena fun. That's what makes your game fun. So you're thinking about strategy, adding strategy for the player. So it could be something as simple as just putting in some kind of blocker like this. Now, instantly, I've got more options. I've got cover. They are positives. I've got cover I can use. I can go in here, I can go this way. I can cover myself up like so. And once I've got the player in the room, I can then lock the door behind them, for example, if I wanted to. It's not a great solution to the problem. More on that in a minute. But here we've got some in uh, interesting things we could do. Another thing we could do is entice a player with some rewards. You may have heard the classic risk versus reward. The greater the risk, the better the reward. So it could be something that we put into the center of the level like here, for example, that has got like pickups or like a big powerful shotgun or a health pickup or a key or something important for the player that they want to use. Entice them, encourage them into that space. Give them an option to do that. And it could be that, that this special thing here is behind more cover. Like this. You know, it could be something like that. Instantly, this room is going to be far, far more optional, uh, far, have far more options for people. So that's another solution. Another solution is what we call leashing. Leashing is when you tie an enemy basically to an invisible rope and they don't leave it. Now, it looks kind of weird when you have like enemies on the ground floor doing this because it looks like they're just sitting there waiting for you. Um, so it kind of doesn't feel right. So what most games do is they'll do this in every arena. You'll find this solution. They'll put something up high like this and put an enemy leash to the top like this or something like that and it's leashed because it can't move off that platform okay it's tied to it and what that means is that i can't force him behind the scenes here i can't say i can't just sit here and all day long expect him to come the rest of them will but he won't because he can't so i eventually will have to go into the room and take him on so you see this a lot in shooters they'll usually put some enemies that are out of like melee range like out, up on top somewhere and we, we call them leashed so when you've got leashed enemies or leashed uh, uh characters like that um it encourages the player to go into the level rather than uh, away from it you encourage them to go forwards and continue that flow so with these there, and there, by the way there's lots more things you can do but with these few basic options it just increases the value of the level far far greater so let's take a look at a the same sort of room done up to be more interesting, more uh, to look around, look around and, and play in and talk about what we see here. So instantly we've got co cover options. We've got enemies hiding behind cover and like out of sight. So I don't know they're there until I'm already well into the room. And now I've got to react. I can like shoot them. I can get behind cover. Shoot, 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 shoot. All that stuff, yeah. Um, we've got an enemy that's leashed up here. He'll be taking us out from afar and instantly we've got a lot more options. Another good thing about this is that I had to drop into the level. I can't get out. So you haven't got the 
unrealistic thing of a door locking behind you. You've got the issue of just like I'm, I'm just physically stuck in the room. I can't go forwards. I have to go into the room. I'm forced to go from here where I'm in danger to cover where I'm safer. So you're saving people um, from going backwards. You want to always go forwards and into the space. And now instantly this room would be far more interesting to shoot him and take on his enemies. And this goes not just for shooters, obviously. This goes for all games. All, all shooters, uh, sword fighting, uh, everything. And by changing also, by, by like playing with elevation, elevation in a shooter is far, uh, really important because you don't, like, that's one level of gameplay going across horizontally. But when you go up and down and around and left and right, that's all other dimensions of, of gameplay. So the more dimensions of gameplay you have, the better. Now, you may notice as I was going through here, a common pattern where we had room, corridor, room, corridor, back to that room, corridor, room, corridor, room. A common pattern that you see in level design. I strongly, strongly recommend using this pattern, especially for linear games. The reason why is pacing. We want the player to be engaged in the game at all times. One way to put them off is to make them incredibly action orientated all the time. Even games like Doom, for example, as action orientated as it is, will have these little breaks in between the big action areas. And these little breaks could be like platforming challenges, a bit of narrative, a bit of platforming. Uh, thing you know whether puzzles you know, whatever it could be but the main thing is is that there are slight breaks and you want your pacing of your action to be sort of like a nice steady wave like this okay so stuff's going on but steadily and by breaking it down with corridors you can easily achieve this this also serves a technical um, reason too because it means you can load up the next room whilst you're walking through the corridor and especially when you've got a bend in it like this it gives you a chance to load up the next room and start all that stuff off. So all these enemies here won't do anything until I, I walk into this corridor. I'll make a trigger box in here, for example, that will turn on their AI and make them start running around shooting things and you know, all that stuff. <coughs> because before them, it's useless. You don't want them to do anything. So corridors are great use for this. And this also, funny enough, applies to open world games. In open world games, the way you design an open world game, and this will probably be its own webinar at some point as well, is so open world level design. If you're new to designing open world games, a good thing to try and do is to design it with walls like this first, and then think about removing the walls, and then think about the challenge of like, okay, I've removed the walls, but how do I keep the player still on this path? And I've got a great example for you. All of us, I guarantee, have played Skyrim in one form or another. And I guarantee all of us, at the start of that game, once you get out of the tutorial section, even though you're in this big open world, all of us went the same way. All of us went down that path. All of us went down to White Run. All the way down to there. If you play the game, you know what I mean. Every single one of you. And that's because it's open world. You, you could have easily just jumped off and gone that way. But the way that it's been set up and designed, especially at the start of the game, where the player's getting new and getting acquainted with the world, you want the player to feel like they are being guided and shown which way to go. Everyone goes that same way, but they don't have to. And this is how you design open world games. So design like this and just remove the walls. And when I say corridors, I don't necessarily mean corridors. I don't have to be exactly corridors. Use the space to explore. So for example, we take this corridor space here. Uh, it looks, it feels like you're too much like a rat in the maze. Yeah, too much of this that like, feels maze-like. So spread it out, make it bigger. So I'll bring that back here, for example. Bring that back there. And bring that like that. And instantly more space, but I can go a bit further. I can now put in um, something like this.
And again, this is something you commonly see in games. With these little corridor bits they do. They do little offshoot bits like this. That don't necessarily have anything to do. But they just expand the space a little bit. They may not have anything in there. Apart from you just running through it. That's totally okay. That's, that's all about pacing. You're happy to do that. And I recommend you do do that. But expand the space out. It, this I would still count as a corridor in this in this design of a level. I would say this is a corridor in the sense that it is a uh, its purpose is to get from A to B. That's all it is. And you could you could put like pickups and things like that, like ammo and things. But for the most part, you're doing this. And you may do other things like as well, like little columns or pillars or some kind type of stuff like that. You know, you break things up how you want it to look. Um, like we could have a little shop window here with a character in the shop selling its wares or you know just a bit of a bit of world building now right back at the start of the session i mentioned about making the world feel bigger by putting in doors that the player can't go through another thing you want you can do is you uh, rely on parallax world design so even though i'm stuck in this little level we can make it feel instantly better by putting stuff outside the level so case in point if i play the game from here Look around. Right, we're in this space, which already feels a lot better. Now it's been spread out a little bit. I've got this little space up here I can run around in. I can just go there. I've only got to go from there to there. Um, but it's already feeling a lot better. But how can we make it feel even better? Well, let's space put things outside the level to indicate the world is actually bigger than it actually appears. So if we just put in like a one of my basic buildings in here. I'll do that there. And we call it parallax because they don't have to be really far away or really big. They just have to be outside enough, with enough distance, to make it feel like there is a bigger world out there. Right, it doesn't necessarily have to make sense. And now if we look at that same perspective, the world is feeling a lot, lot bigger. It feels like there's stuff everywhere, but really there isn't. See the difference it makes? And that parallax effect really sells that distance of that space. So building level design is more than just the actual level that you're in. It's also the space outside of the level. You want to make sure that the player feels like doing something a lot bigger. So, yeah, like that. So another thing you can do as well is to put in, like we've done with doorways, areas that the player could go but can't go. Um, so if we go into here, I could put a little like, alleyway type thing. <clears throat> like this. Again, making that level feel a bit bigger, there's a space here I can look down, but I can't do anything about. So you usually do stuff like that with fences, bollards, uh, crashed cars, whatever you want to pick, fire. Um, this helps make the level again feel bigger because there's stuff that you can see that the, the world out there, there's a whole world out here, it's just we can't actually do anything with it. Now if you think back to what this room was like, where it was a simple straight corridor, like with a bend, bend in it, we now got something far more interesting, and especially if I do things like put an NPC here talking to us, like if I do put other doors or animations happening or uh, or uh, you know whatever, instantly we've got a far more interesting place to be in, and all of it just to serve the purpose of slowing the player down. We're going to slow down the action, pace them through the level, and but whilst they're continuing their flow through it. Now, some of the best games out there that do flow very well are the ones you don't even notice them doing this. 
And there's one that always comes to my mind. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple, but there's one that always sticks in my mind as a, as a memory. And that is uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, like the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, as if it weren't confusing enough. Um, the favelas. In that level, there's a bit where you have to run through the favelas. And you feel like you're just running rampant through this space. You, like, you have no direction to go. You're just running because you're being chased down. And then you end up in the right space. No matter which way you go, you end up in the right space. And that's really cool because it makes you feel like you're fantasy running. It feels like an action movie because you're like, you're a like bad boy. is running through this thing and you can boom, boom, jump in and uh, you're, you're there in the right place. Um, other games that do that quite well, like the Uncharted games where you're getting chased by things. Like you, you think, you, you just hope you're going the right way and you end up, you are. Uh, there's no real wrong way. It's just the game is frantic enough and making it look busy enough that you feel like you're just frantically running through the environment and the world feels big enough and you just feel like you're just taking a chance and you think, oh, I'll go this way. But in reality, that is the only way. Uncharted does that very well, especially two and three and four. Um, so um, that is the basics of our door level design stuff. So to recap, things you want to be aware of is signposting. You want to make sure it's clear to the player which door is the correct door to go through. And if a door is locked but can be opened later, try to make that clear as well. That could be a simple like uh, display on it. It could be an icon. It could whatever whatever you want to be. But signposting some way using textures, lighting, mod uh, models, whatever. And that's something we could do a whole session on again um, and talk a bit more about that. Next up is composition. Composing your shot for shot. So think about where the player is going. Think about your key positions the player is going to go. Think about how you want to frame that shot there. So for example, I put boxes here. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but I put boxes there. The reason why I put boxes there is because I wanted to break up this silhouette of this line going down here. And I wanted to hide this door a bit more. So the player had to walk more into the level to see it. So I did boxes there. And I also wanted to stop the player from ever seeing this one until I got up here. So using something like that to help me compose that shot a little bit better. Think about your negative space as well as your positive space. And go through there. Okay, use lighting to help signpost doorways. Use linking, positional linking, putting things next to each other, linking with assets, linking with cinematics, linking things together to indicate that those things belong together. Just by putting things next to each other or in proximity to each other it makes them feel like they're grouped together. Like, for example, it may, I mean, it seems obvious enough, but if I had like two boxes like this and then another two boxes like this, the two on the left feel like they're grouped together. That's because they are. They belong to each other. These two also belong to each other. But if I were to put more evenly spaced together, now they'll share equal weighting. They'll share equal importance. If one is separated from the bunch, yeah, that one feels more important because it's separate. It's standing out. So it's all about positional. Yeah, if I put that one, that, that two separate like that, it's not clear if these two are linked together at all because these two are linked together by position. We're clear, we're making that distinction in our head. But these two, we're not too sure about. So avoid doing things like this, where you've got two things next to each other that are clearly linked or positional. And then you've got two separate ones because this in indicates that they are missing their partner. Basics of that system. More on that another time if you want. Uh, fourth is flow. Think about flow around your level. Try to make the player always moving forwards. Try not to make them backtrack. And if they are backtracking because of the game design, like Metroidvania games, try to make sure the experience going backwards is more important than, or it's just as important as the, mo as the movement ones. So the player's noticing more things. Um, I can show you an interesting solution to that. Hold on. Uh... So this is that noclip.website thing I've used before on these live streams. I would strongly recommend checking it out. It's really cool. It allows you to explore some level designs in your browser. Um, so here I've got Metroid Prime uh, Chozo Ruins. Let's take a look at an example of how they sign posts and let you through this level. So first of all, <coughs> got a little bit of corridor space and only one door. So you have to go through that door. Now, ignore the big bird. I don't know why it's there. But here we got the first sign of the player going in with choice on the cards. And we think about that value, putting out the value markers. So if we were to highlight key points of interest, one would be this bit over here, two would be this bit over here with the ramps. 
Why is this bit over here standing out? Because it's got light on it. Yeah, but it's 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 showing itself, but it's still hiding itself. The door's recessed in. It's got pillars blocking it. It's obstructing, but there's still some highlight there. So if the player wasn't looked down there, they'd see the door is locked. They're not meant to see it. Not the main one. Now, next, I'd carry on going forwards up to here. Also, there's enemies here too that to encourage the player to focus this way. They spawn like here. Um, so encourage the player to look this way and they'll see this ramp here which stands out obviously because it's a ramp like a half pipe and I think what the hell is that for use for obviously they come back to that later in the game and if they were look around they'll see collectibles up there wait, waiting for them but anyway come up here bum 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 and we get up here now the way they've signposted this in game is they are teasing the player with collectibles which is what you do in metroidvania you want to tease the player with things and say like hey look at this thing I'm going to get over here somehow um, like that and they could try walking over there and not be able to get it but the correct way is actually like lit up by this texture. This is like basically a big fat arrow saying go this way, which is the way you have to go. So you go down this way into the ruins into the next bit. And if I just turn on the layers for that, uh, yeah, you go down the corridor into here. And let me just let me just turn them all on. Uh, another corridor, little platforming puzzle, blah blah blah, blah. and into this room. Now, look at the composition of this shot. We've got a door up here. We've got enemies spawning up here. We've got a collectible over here. And we've got a tree branch over here using lines to help show us which way to go. So we go up the ramp, up the stairs. Hey, look, there's something else we haven't seen before. We're going to use that later. Go through the door. Blah, blah, blah. Another corridor. Another corridor. Another corridor. Another corridor. Boom. Fight, 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 fight. This room is really interesting. We'll come back to it in a second. So we go through this door at the end. It's clearly the way to go. There's no other door, no other way. We just see that's the way to go. Bom, bom, bom. Go through the door. Another corridor. Another corridor. Boom. Action. Arena. Um, and then you go through here, do the little boss minigame thing, and get your missile pickup. If you are doing a Metroidvania, you want to typically let the player experiment with the thing they get. So they get this, and they, they see this setting up here. They can go in here and pick up an extra power up. Can't go any further because they need a ball ball. But, yep, they go through there. And they go back out. And now they're backtracking. But remember what I said about show, making sure the player sees something different on the way out? So they want to go through these corridors. And go through here. Let's back to this room. Oh, hold on a second. There's a door down here. And instantly the players go, ooh, I didn't notice that the first time I was here. Let's go through it. And because they has a lock on it, they can go through it now. Because you blast off the thing here with missiles. So you go through here, and hey presto, you've got the map room, and get that map. Flow. It's flowing the player straight to where they need to go, the map room. So like, hey, pick up the map. So the player could have had made the choice to jump down and have a look around, and would have come across that. Wouldn't have been able to enter it, but they would have seen that. But here, we've purposely put it in front of the player's eye line. We made it very obvious to the player that there's something here for them to go do. So off they go. And then they continue going back through the way they came. And when they come back out, um, obviously, they want to come back this way. They're going to notice more power-ups after this little thing. wonder what that was. And they go, oh, look, something over there. Go back through here. Whoop, 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 whoop. And back through here. Okay, now we're on to the next bit. Where they go, okay, there's another platform bit up here. How do we get up there? And then you got, like, they're going to continue exploring. And, well, they can go back to that door they just saw earlier. They can go down this way. And, like, go through there if they wanted to. Or they can work their way up through here if they want. Yeah, they've got options. But this is the right way. They go this way. So you're basically teasing the player with bits that it needs and then tell them to come back to it. So here, they go back to here, like, oh, there's a little morph ball thing. I can't use that. So you go up here, blah, blah, blah. Fight your thing. Get your morph ball. Sweet. Now I've got to use the morph ball to get out. I can't get out without the morph ball. I need to go through there. But hey, half pipe. That looks familiar. Anyway, carry on going. And get our morph ball. Yeah. And I can keep on going through and through, and you go to the next bit, which then opens up because you need the morph ball to get through this bit. Okay. So, there we go. That's an example of signposting in action in this game and using the backtracking to help showcase new things to the player. So, hopefully, you guys have learned something from this little seminar today and this little webinar. Um, and I'm going to try and do more level design webinars. So we looked at doors in particular. There's one about stairs I really want to do. It sounds really dumb, but I really want to do one about stairs. Um, uh, as well as many other things like these, uh, like composition and things like that in their own, 
dedicated spaces too, but uh, and designing combat arenas too. So if you want to uh, me to cover anything in particular, like level design, uh, maybe open level design, where you want to talk about that, um, let us know in the chat. Put in chat what kind of level design things you want to be covering in the next one we do of these. In the meantime, does anyone have any questions they want to ask? I saw a question coming up about um, um, from Aditya. So can we create a background that looks like land far away, but it's just part of the skybox or image of land? Uh, yeah, of course you can, but it's all an illusion. Uh, it's always never as far as it actually is. You just change the scale of it. Um, again, back to my Noclip example. If I load up Dark Souls. <coughs> Got this one. So Dark Souls, you have this like, starting point. Now you got all these mountains. Look at all these mountains. They must be so far away. Uh, they're not. Um, if I just turn up the camera speed a bit. They are just flat cutouts down here. They're just nice pictures. That's all they are. They're not really far away. It's over there. I can see it right there. But... From that perspective, because of how they look and how they've been scaled, how they've been parallaxed together, they look like they're very far away. And you look like you're in part of a world that's a lot bigger than it actually is. Um, again, like over here, you think, oh, look, 3D. You're like, mm, no. It's just flat. So when you're designing levels, think outside of your level as well. Think around it. Not just what's in the level. Think what's outside of it too. Let's look at another example. Um, let's pick. Um, uh, let's pick. I uh, know. Oh, let's go to Final Fantasy 10. And let's do. Um, Zanakan Ruins. I love Final Fantasy 10. Um, uh, not that one. Um, let's go. Yeah, let's go to this one. Uh, the overparts. Is it? Yeah, there we go. So obviously this is a level. Um, this is the level. This bit here. This this bit here. This is all you do. Yeah, you just run along this. But and your camera stops here and you do a little cutscene. You look at that thing. But you make the level feel so much bigger. The world feels so much bigger by just putting just little objects outside of it and then like just random little things. And we can see over here already when you pay attention to it the flat cardboard standouts you have the background using that parallax effect to make things feel like they're further away than they actually are yeah but if you look the, the, the design of this level is very damn simple yeah that's all it is and even up top here it'd be very basic no roofs nothing just repeating textures around it yeah and you can go to another part of the game uh, let's go to uh, the beach so again like a village scene like this which has got mostly a fixed camera you don't have full freedom movement of it yeah you have some freedom but not full um, so in here, like, they've got this tree line. Obviously, the tree line is just all cardboard cutouts. They do nothing. Yeah. And the level itself is actually a lot simpler than it's led to believe. Yeah. And even, like, the clouds aren't that far away, really. You can see here, like, this is already a lot... Obviously, this is an older game, so we use the Sky Atmosphere system in Unreal 4, uh, 5 to help uh, with this. But you, this is just a simple texture that just goes around in a circle. <coughs> That's all it's doing, it's just spinning. It makes the world feel like it's, you know, moving clouds. Now, one thing that's really interesting about doors as well that I forgot to mention is about the sizes of doors. There was a good GDC talk um, a few years back about um, Modern Warfare 1, the remake. Modern Warfare, four one, and um, they've done a big talk about their doorways and how AI can now navigate through the doorways together. Because um, there's a problem with doorways in most games, in that AI does not go very well with doors because they are 
quite narrow. Realistic, like realistic doors in your household are a lot narrower than doors in games. And if we were to actually look at doorways in games, you'll see that they're actually all quite big. If, if, especially if AI has to walk through it. Um, if AI doesn't have to walk through it, then yeah, you can make it smaller. But I mean, we'll try and show an example. Um, what would have doorways? Half-Life 2, maybe? It is smart. It does a lot with a not a lot. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and it has it had to back in those days because you're limited by technology. And you'll find that when you have limitations put upon yourself, that's usually when you're more creative um, and how things are done. So this is Half-Life 2's setup. Again, they do the whole thing of putting stuff outside the level to make it look like there's more, but there isn't. Something. Um, if you've not seen this before, um, this has got some interesting little anecdotes about it. If you remember, I it finished loading. If you remember Half-Life 2's starting um, level and how, it, how the whole game starts, we can talk about how it works in here on a technical level. Um, but yeah, if you look in here, like doorways um, are usually wide open. If the AI's got to walk through it. Um, especially if it's unscripted walkthrough. So I think we go this way. Uh, well, no, what way do we go? This way? Can't recall which way we go. Yeah, this way. Um, go through here. Blah, 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 blah. Um, like, all you say, it doesn't actually move. They just stand there doing stuff. But you see, like, big, big gaping hole. Doors aren't that wide. Um, like, things like these little doors, you see them interact with it you don't necessarily go through it um yeah it's a big a big thing they do um same about corridors as well they usually make them a bit wider than they need to be but this is a good example of like spaces that you can't see into like you can't you can't get into so you can see into but you can't get reach just make the place feel a lot bigger um to show also how this works and let's start the game with the cut scenes in the same level because it has to be the same level because um, it's loading in and loading out the game all at once. So this is where you start over here. Uh, let me turn the speed up a bit more. So over here, you may recognize a few of these things already. But here you have a big black box. And what they've done, by the looks of it, is when you start over here, you start with the G-Man. And he and he's talking to you. That's how the game starts. He talks to you in this black void about your mission, blah, blah, blah. Um... I don't know what that is. That's just something. Anyway, he talks to you stuff, and then you travel along this black void. Okay, so if I get out of this void here. There you go. So you travel along it. This is why it's this long, I think, because at certain points through it, it transitions to these cuts, these flashbacks and flash forwards. And so I think there's trigger volumes throughout this box. So you, you pass through it at a steady rate, and it teleports you to this uh, view, and you like, watch the flashback, then cut to this view where you see this stuff going on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and like oh what's what's all this stuff and he just keeps on going through it and just uses it like a timeline it just scrubs through it and then when you get to the end it teleports you to this black box over here and you like it eventually goes into this black box where you it cuts this for you and then you go into this door <coughs> And then it teleports you again to the actual level. Or oh, fades in the level. I can't it does now, but it does something. And it goes into here. So it can't go through the back of this because there's a train there. So it teleports you to a second cart here. And then you go through the rest of the level. Hey, the door just opened its own. Oh, nice. Um, and then you crack on. Uh, some of the CCTV cameras, if you want to know how you use CCTV, uh, up here is a big TV screen where the bad guy talks to you. If you want to know how that's done, that's done over here. In this little black box. Let's fly over to it. So here we have what is like a set, basically. So there's the screensaver for the TV screen. Uh, you see that on the TV screen. Like You see like the uh, screen screensaver, basically. And when that when he starts talking, this is animating, and there's a camera here filming him basically, and it's doing a, a scene capture. So uh, if you've been using Unreal and scene captures, that's what you're doing with that. You're scene capturing to texture, and then you project that onto your screens over there. 
So if I go back to this main level, you'll see some of that in there already. Uh, Source Engine still uses... Uh, Source Engine does a weird thing with skyboxes. I can explain a bit what they do there. But, um, yeah, so... Uh, there was one I saw a minute ago. Where was it? Yeah, this. That screensaver was a thing we just saw on that little texture. It just hides the texture and animation. That's what it does. There's a lot, of, a lot of games that just put stuff in front of the camera to hide things. Um, especially, like, doing in interesting transitions. Um, but that's how you do stuff like that. Um, yeah. And you'd be surprised at what you can get away with um, by doing various little tricks. Uh, there's another one down here. So this is a room you get teleported to, I think. Um, and to simulate there being a bright light outside, it's just a white box. That's it. That's what it is. A white emissive box. Just to simulate that it's light outside. Like you can't actually see nothing. Yeah. And these games are f uh, oh, modern games are full of stuff outside their maps. It's just especially for animation stuff. But like Last of Us, the way Last of Us does their animations for their cutscenes is that you're playing the game like this around here, and then it cuts to a set that's way like way over there somewhere, and that set will be where the animation takes place. And you usually use different models too because they usually have more bones like for facial animation stuff, and that's when I animate that there. And then when it's finished, it'll cut back to the game level and you carry on playing for the game. So you do things like that. Um, that's what I do. Um, but yeah, Source Engine, the way they do skyboxes in Source Engine is a bit weird. And you can't really sit in this. But basically, like there's usually, there's more to the city than what you see here. Okay, But what they do is they actually have a separate level that's scaled down. And there's a camera inside of it. And it projects that, that level onto the skybox around you, essentially. And it makes it look like the world's a lot lot bigger than it actually is, but it really isn't. Um, it's just rendering a different camera. We don't tend to do that anymore. Um, it's just Source Engine still does it. Um, I don't know if anyone still uses that for that reason, but yeah, you can do that. But for the most part, yeah, in most games we just do this now. We just stick it outside the map. Um, but yeah. So that... Yeah, so do let us know. What kind of stuff would you like to see? Yeah, like it is very much like map painting in old movies. Yeah, uh, very good. Um, yeah, so what kind of stuff would you like to see level design-wise in these sort of webinars? I'm um, interested to hear what you want to see. Uh, do let us know in the chat and uh, comments. Um, let's answer a couple of questions. Um, um, um question how would you go about randomizing static meshes using blueprints in a level uh yeah it's pretty simple all you gotta do is um you make a blueprint add the mesh to it and you make an array of meshes it could possibly have static meshes static mesh uh and make it an array and then you just um, put in what message you want to use. So do like chair. Uh, lamp. You know, whatever. And then on the script, wherever you want to do it. I'm going to do it in construction script so you can see it clearer. Um, set static mesh. And you do mesh random array item and put that in there and that's it so as i drag that into my scene it randomizes what it's going to be and every time i play the game it will randomize what it's going to be yeah. uh will this be uploaded to youtube afterwards i missed the first hour or so so it'll be available to patreon members uh, all, all tier patrons uh, straight after the show um and then everyone else will get it a couple of weeks time uh in the future so if you want to support the channel head over to patreon and take part also in our creator challenge um that'd be great um, do I remember the door mechanic from Rainbow Six? Um, Rainbow Six Three? No. Well, uh, you talk about like, when they burst through the door, that sort of stuff. I could show you how to do that if you want. I'd make AI like line up against the door and bust through the door. I won't do it not now, but you know, we can do a video, a few videos on that. Um,
But yeah. Uh, yeah, so the website is noclip.website if you want to use that website. It's really cool. I like using it all the time. It's good fun. And it's a great way to show people stuff that they may not really be aware of. And that's the whole point. As a game designer, you want to start playing games and taking real notice of these things. They're designed to, for you to not notice them. That's the whole point of it. It'd be, it'd so be so smooth and transitionless that you wouldn't have any issues. But try to pay attention to it. As a game designer and level designer, you can benefit from it. Pay attention to those little things and how it handles this. Um, and you, you'll learn so much more by playing games again when you realize what the hell you're doing and looking for. So pay attention to it. Look for these things and understand why these things are done like this. And bear in mind of those recap of those four things. Signposting. Composition of the shot. Linking. And flow. And don't forget about what we spoke about regarding enemy combat arenas and think about how doorways can be used for that and how you can negate the doorway from being a crutch by the proposition of value in the level, placing valuable areas for the uh, character to go into. But. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us live. Hopefully you enjoy this. Hopefully you've all learned something from this and found it interesting. If you'd like to see more live streams like this, please, please, please do let us know. Always interested to know what you guys want to learn about. Level design is a big passion of mine. I want to talk about a lot more because, as I said at the start of the video, or at the start of the stream, is it's usually the bit that I see people struggle with the most. They'll put together the game, it works fine, but the level design is to be desired. It, it's just nothing, especially open world design. I might have to do like a whole thing about open world design. It's usually a big problem. Um, because they will design and not think about the space. And they'll think, oh, we'll try and make it like real life. You don't want to make it real life. Real life is boring and scary and nah. We want it to be more fun. Yeah. And we want to encourage the player through our level. We want to draw them through. Yeah. So uh, let us know what you think and what you want to do. And um, yeah, we're back again live on Wednesday for question time. So bring your questions along with, uh, with you on next week's question time. Uh, next Saturday, we'll be back to our Pokemon Retro Remake. So join us live back again next Saturday for Pokemon again. And um, as we continue that journey, uh, I'm really happy with the progress we've made so far in that. And I'm really excited to see where that goes, uh, which is really cool. Uh, this week, you can expect more videos coming from the Action RPG series, um, uh, some animation blueprint stuff. We'll be looking at that uh, and some more how to's coming along nicely, too. And a few more surprises along the way, hopefully this week or next week. We'll see. Um, but thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. And, and if you want to support the channel, please do over patreon.com forward slash Ryan Ailey. Not only will your donation help the channel out, but also you can take part in our creator challenge where you'll get feedback about the work you're doing and you get a little jam every single month you can take part in. Um, so everyone is about to finish up their one now and the new one starts on the 1st of September. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting to see people try and do this. And I've played some, I've played through and looked at the projects people have done for this already. And it's been, it's been great work, great variety and um, put together some great feedback for everyone. So it's been a really worthwhile experience for this first month of doing it. So thank you so much for watching. And hope everyone is doing well and stay safe. And I'll... Uh, what tier is the Game Jam Monthly? It's every, every tier. Uh, you can do just $1 a month. And it'll be fine. You can join in. And if you... Uh, and the best one, by the way, gets this little metal pin badge. I'll try and hold it to the camera, but I don't mean you can see it too well. It's black, so I'm not going to show that well. But it's a little Ryan Eddie Games pin badge. I'm going to send to the best one. As long as I can, depending on where you are in the world, um, I'll try and send you one of these. So, little, little, little uh, prize type thing. But yeah, thank you again for everyone. Um, and thank you for subscribing. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.